13. The Woman Taken in Adultery During the course of our analysis of the law, repeated references were made to the confirmation of the law in the Gospels. It is not our purpose here either to repeat those confirmations or to attempt an exhaustive catalogue of every reference to the law in the Gospels. One event, however, although cited in some detail earlier, deserves further attention. The story of the woman taken in adultery, in John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. Because this particular incident has been cited as an instance of the setting aside of the law, as the prime example, in fact, it needs further attention because it, in fact, is a confirmation of the law. Had the incident been at all antinomian, it would have provided the scribes and Pharisees with exactly the charge they wanted with which to condemn Jesus. The charge of Jesus against the scribes and Pharisees was precisely their antinomianism. It strongly denounced them publicly for their neglect of the law for tradition. Matthew chapter 15 verses 1 to 9 No answer was possible against this charge. Clearly, the leaders of the people had set aside the law by means of their humanistic legal tradition. The whole point of the attack of these leaders was to try to show that Jesus, when confronted by the hard facts of a concrete case, would be no more a strict champion of the law than they were. The culminating example of this attempt to embarrass Jesus was this incident of the woman taken in adultery. To ask for the full enforcement of the law, the death penalty, would have been to invite hostility, because the prevailing attitude was one of moral laxity. To deny the death penalty would have enabled the Pharisees to charge Jesus with hypocrisy. He would then have been in the same school of thought as the Pharisees he condemned. Quite obviously, Jesus did not take an antinomian stand, because the Pharisees left confounded, and the incident obviously confirmed Jesus as the champion of the law. A woman had been taken in adultery in the very act. John chapter 8 verse 4. The woman was brought unto him. We cannot assume that she came voluntarily. She may have been dragged there but the text does not indicate this. Apparently, the scribes and Pharisees involved had police powers or had, with the assistance of the authorities, used such legal powers as were necessary to compel her compliance. Having such legal authority, they were also requiring that Jesus preside at the hearing. The man involved in the acts was not brought forward. We have no knowledge of the reason for this, although it would appear that it would have aggravated the offence of Jesus had he either demanded the death penalty for a woman or, on the other hand, allowed an adulterous woman to go free. More emotional reaction could be milked by the use of an adulterous woman than an adulterous man. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. John chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. The reason for the incident is plainly stated. Grounds for an accusation against Jesus were sought. Would Jesus persist as the champion of the law? Or would he retreat into the use of some aspect of the Pharisaic tradition? But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. John chapter 8 verse 6 
At this point, the comment of Burgon is most telling and deserves full citation. The scribes and Pharisees bring a woman to our Saviour on a charge of adultery. The sin prevailed to such an extent among the Jews that the divine enactments concerning one so accused had long since fallen into practical oblivion. On the present occasion, our Lord is observed to revive his own ancient ordinance after a hitherto unheard of fashion. The trial by bitter water, or water of conviction. See Numbers chapter 5, verses 11 to 31 was a species of ordeal intended for the vindication of innocence, the conviction of guilt. But according to the traditional belief, the test proved inefficacious unless the husband himself was innocent of the crime whereof he accused his wife. Let the provisions of the law contained in Numbers chapter 5 verses 16 to 24 be now considered. The accused woman having been brought near and set before the Lord, the priest took holy water in an earthen vessel and put of the dust of the floor of the tabernacle into the water. Then, with the bitter water that causeth the curse in his hand, he charged the woman by oath. Next, he wrote the curses in a book and blotted them out with the bitter water causing the woman to drink the bitter water that causeth the curse. Whereupon, if she were guilty, she fell under a terrible penalty, her body testifying visibly to her sin. If she was innocent, nothing followed. And now, who sees not that the Holy One dealt with his hypocritical assailants as if they had been the accused parties? Into the presence of incarnate Jehovah verily they had been brought, and perhaps when he stooped down and wrote upon the ground, it was a bitter sentence against the adulterer and adulteress which he wrote. We have but to assume some connection between the curse which he thus traced in the dust of the floor of the tabernacle and the words which he uttered with his lips, and he may with truth be declared to have taken of the dust and put it on the water, and cause them to drink of the bitter water which causeth the curse. For when, by his Holy Spirit, our great high priests in his human flesh addressed these adulterers, what did he but present them with living water? Chapter 5, verse 17 So the Septuagint, in an earthen vessel, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Verse 7, chapter 5, verse 1. Did he not further charge them with an oath of cursing, saying, If ye have not gone aside to uncleanness, be ye free from the bitter water? But if ye be denied, on being presented with which alternative, did they not, self-convicted, go out one by one? And what else was this but their own acquittal of the sinful woman, for whose condemnation they had showed themselves so impatient? Surely it was the water of conviction, as it is six times called, which they had been compelled to drink. Whereupon, convicted by their own conscience, as St. John relates, they had pronounced the other's acquittal. Finally, Note that by himself declining to condemn the accused woman, our Lord also did in effect blot out those curses which he had already written against her in the dust when he made the floor of the sanctuary his book. Because this incident took place in the temple, John chapter 8 verse 2, Burgon's comment is all the more to the point. The temple dust he wrote in met the requirements of the law. His action placed every accuser on trial immediately. That they were aware of this, the text makes clear, 
for we are told that all felt convicted by their own conscience. John chapter 8 verse 9 Charges had been made against the woman by the scribes and Pharisees. Their charges represented a clear-cut case against a woman taken in the very act of adultery. The counter-charges by Jesus, by his actions and by his declaration, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. John chapter 8 verse 7 Roke them. As themselves guilty men, they suspected secret evidence on his part against them. They were busy trying to collect evidence against Jesus. This made it easier for them to believe that Jesus had done the same to them. These scribes and Pharisees had preferred charges against the woman in the place of her husband. Jesus placed them in the husband's category by invoking Numbers chapter 5 by his writing in the dust. If they were guilty, and Jesus knew of their guilt, then, if he invoked the death penalty, could he not charge them also? By invoking Numbers 5, Jesus, in effect, placed them on trial also. The day come to judgment with clean hands. It will not do to plead the high moral standards of Pharisees. These men were planning the death of Jesus. In the face of their deliberate and calculating plans against God's Messiah, the sin of adultery was a trifling matter to such men. They had no stomach for an accusation against them which could cite God's requirements of a death penalty. When Jesus said, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. John chapter 8 verse 7 He was not referring to sins in general, but to the sin of adultery. A general statement would mean no court of law is possible. The specific reference meant that men guilty of a crime were not morally free to condemn that crime in another unless they condemned it in themselves. We are told that all these scribes and Pharisees were then convicted by their own conscience. Verse 9 Moreover, Jesus had confirmed the death penalty. He had simply demanded honest witnesses to step forward and execute her, to first cast a stone at her. Verse 7 To remain as witnesses against her was to invite witnesses against themselves. To testify to a witnessed fact and confirm a death penalty against a woman was to invite a witness unto death against themselves. They left. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. John chapter 8 verses 10 and 11 At this point, it is necessary to distinguish between civil or political forgiveness. Civil forgiveness occurs when a condemned person pays the penalty for his crime, when restitution is made and the moral claims of the law are satisfied. A thief who had robbed a man of an ox and restored fivefold is thereupon forgiven. Religious forgiveness requires as a prior condition restitution or civil forgiveness. A thief cannot be forgiven religiously if he has not made restitution. There is a similar distinction between civil condemnation and religious condemnation. Civil condemnation is for offences against the civil law. Religious condemnation 
is both for offences against the civil law and for disbelief of God and his law word. The two kinds of forgiveness and condemnation are distinct but related. Jesus had been asked to make a pronouncement on the civil law with respect to adultery. He affirmed the death penalty. The witnesses, however, had withdrawn their charge and had disappeared. There was thus no legal case against the woman. Legally, Jesus could not therefore sustain a case. Neither do I condemn thee. But a moral case existed. The humility of the woman, who acknowledged him to be Lord, indicates some evidence of change in her, and perhaps regeneration. But Jesus simply said, Go and sin no more, an echo of his words in John chapter 5 verse 14. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. It is more than possible that she was religiously a changed person and forgiven by God's grace. We are simply told that no ground for legal condemnation existed at the moment. This does not rule out subsequent legal condemnation. Her husband, if she had one, is not evident in this episode, but he would have had grounds for some kind of action under existing law if he chose. This is not the concern of the text. She was granted acquittal in terms of the evidences of the immediate hearing. Jesus recognised the reality of her offence by his warning, Go and sin no more. The fact of this warning indicates some evidences of a charge in her, since it was contrary to our Lord's practice to warn those who would not be warned. Matthew chapter 7 verse 6 For Christ to tell an unregenerate person to sin no more is unreasonable. The particular sin referred to was adultery. She was charged with a responsibility to chastity as an aspect of her new life in Christ. The woman addressed Jesus as Lord. John chapter 8 verse 11. The scribes and Pharisees simply called him Master, verse 4. And the disciples themselves often spoke of him as simply Rabbi, John chapter 1 verse 49. Her conduct here indicated a changed person. In brief, instead of any evidence of antinomianism, this episode confirmed emphatically the position of Jesus as the champion of the law and he confounded the attempts of the scribes and Pharisees to prove otherwise. The sin of Phariseeism was thus exposed. Phariseeism, first of all, denied the necessity of conversion. Man, by his unaided free will, is able to save himself, to choose between good and evil, and make himself good. Both free will and self-salvation were thus affirmed, and predestination and conversion or regeneration denied. Second, the Pharisees had, while professing to hold to the law of God, converted it into the traditions of men. Thus, they had denied the biblical doctrines of justification and sanctification and were, accordingly, the particular target of Christ's denunciation. The Pharisees, professing to be champions of God's word, were in fact its enemies and perverters.